Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, May 15th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Tonight, should amnesty be given to looters and rioters? Then report, woman fired for refusing her employer's spy tech, and a school deems old glory too offensive to display. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. What type of balkanized country is this where you can't have an American flag t-shirt and how effective the establishment has been at creating division in this country? A South Carolina school folded on their flag ban after a student rolled up with a squad of veterans. This was 18-year-old senior Peyton Robinson. He was ordered uh, to remove two American flags from his truck. The school initially told him it was because some could possibly find it offensive. School officials then changed their tune, citing safety concerns, saying it could be a visual hazard, these, these flags. By Thursday, however, the school completely reversed its position following protests by students, parents, and veterans who flocked to school grounds waving U.S. flags. It's freedom. Do you want to fly a flag? Fly it. What the heck? When I hear that you can't fly the flag, it makes my blood run red and my blood is red. And it just proves if you stand up for your country, you stand up for what you believe in, things get changed. And the school released this announcement on their website. They said, due to the outstanding display of patriotism through peaceful demonstration, it is apparent to us that many are not happy about this policy. Now, school officials are going to be reviewing the standing policy regarding flags. They've decided that an exception will be, will be made for the American flag, as long as the size of the flag, you know, isn't going to create a driving hazard. So, hooray, in America, we are allowed to fly the American flag. It's not offensive. Isn't that absurd? But now some also justices served for another man who decided to stand up for what is right. We reported on this earlier in the week about the IRS seizing more than $100,000 from a convenience store owner, Lyndon McClellan. They said he was making large cash deposits like a convenience store owner might do. The IRS initially offered him a settlement. They said that they would give him half of his money back, but McClellan refused. He said for him, the government seizure of his more than $107,000 is a matter of what's right and wrong. So after months of sleepless nights and thousands in litigation fees, the government said they're going to dismiss the case. The U.S. attorney, Thomas Walker, cited changes to the Department of Justice's policy regarding civil asset forfeiture that was made in March as the reason for dropping this lawsuit against McClellan, uh, against the bank account. They seized these assets last July. So it's a good thing that he stuck it out and didn't decide to go for that settlement. Initially, they said that he needed to decide by March had he agreed to take that a settlement and just get half of his money back, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be able to have gotten all of his money back. Most people do agree to the, the, to the settlement because they can't afford to fight it. They can't afford to fight for their property. Now McClellan is continuing to press forward to see if he can get his uh, attorney's fees covered as well as the loss in uh, the interest that he would have received with having that money in the bank because the government is required by law to put that money that they've seized in an interest-bearing account. And the government wants to keep the interest that they earned on the money that they seized. So it's totally infuriating because the man was never even charged with the crime. Never. They just took his money and then he had to fight for it back. So obviously another bully government agency run amok. And in this case, it seems they're getting a little bit of justice served. Now, a California woman <laughs> raised some red flags here for me, but she is suing her former employer. Uh, she was claiming that she was fired after she deleted an app from her phone that was a required app. Um, it, it was tracking her movements 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and this was an app required by her work. Uh, Myrna Arias says she works for the Intermex Wire Transfer Service when she says her boss, John Stubitz, fired her for deleting the Zora job management app from her smartphone. Zora tracks and manages mobile employees while they're in the field. Now, Arias said that when she and her fellow employees asked Stubitz if he could track them when they weren't working, 
Stubitz admitted that employees would be monitored while off duty. And he bragged that he knew how fast she was driving at specific moments ever since she had installed the app on her phone. So this is pretty jarring to me because we already know that a lot of companies are requiring that their employees give them access to all of their social media accounts. Now they're going to require that you download apps on your phone that are able to track all of your movements so your boss can see what you're up to. So <laughs> absolutely pretty crazy there. Now we have another story on InfoWars today. Uh, rioters in Baltimore caused more than $9 million in property damage during the Freddie Gray protests. And now the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is leading, they're leading the charge. Uh, several groups are calling for amnesty for those who've been arrested. A Facebook page titled, Massive Protest Amnesty for All Arrestees, Drop the Charges, Baltimore's Youth Are Not Thugs, Release All Those Arrested. And they announced that they're going to be holding a protest Saturday, May 16th, uh, at 3 p.m., so that will be tomorrow. Now, the Baltimore People's Power Assembly admits that the call for amnesty is for those who looted stores and destroyed private property. The group explains in a statement, they say, how can city officials equate property damage with the life of a human being? The youth of Baltimore need our support. We demand drop all charges and grant full amnesty. The people of Baltimore, especially the youth, need full employment at a livable wage decent education and housing, not jails, racism, and police terror. So obviously I don't disagree with the last part of that statement, but I mean, these riots, this looting went on for days. It's not as if it was just in one little fit of rage and just in this inflamed passion here, this happened. It, it was dragged out over a course of days, $9 million in property damage took place. So we do we really wanna set the precedent, especially as we're uh, being warned that we can expect more unrest to be unfolding in cities across America. Um, we're starting this cycle of unrest. So are we basically setting a precedent that looting and rioting and t millions of dollars in property damage is going to be okay? And that when you do that, you're just going to get off. But on the same token, where are the consequences for some of these police officers who are getting away with the crimes that they're committing? Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hirsch says he is not backing off anything that he said in his blockbuster 10,000 word story that was released this week, um, arguing that the official account of the American raid that took down Osama bin Laden is based on one big lie. Uh, he says what is arguably seen as the apex of Obama's presidency is actually built on a lie. Seymour Hirsch refuses to back down now, this story has been debated all throughout the week. A lot of people are attacking not only his account, but also his credibility as a journalist. Yeah, and I think it's important, Leanne, for people to remember uh, that Seymour Hirsch has broken a lot of major, major stories. Mm -hmm. Things that have really had huge impact on the history of this nation. One of them, of course, is uh, the church committee. That came from an, an investigative report by Seymour Hirsch Back in 1974, here's the title of this. Huge CIA operation reported in U.S. against anti-war forces and other dissidents in Nixon years. And they point out in the article that at least 10,000 Americans were maintained, uh, a list of 10,000 Americans maintained by a special unit of the CIA that reported directly to the director, Richard Helms. Now, of course, Richard Helms, you famously see the pictures of him at the church committee hearing, uh, holding up the assassination gun and other things. The church committee hearing focused primarily on the CIA, primarily focused on uh, sensational items like that, assassinations. He, however, really got to the uh, crux of the matter, and it was picked up by uh, Pike. And they had a House committee uh, hearing at the same time that the Senate had its church committee hearing. Pike, who headed that in the House, really got to the gist of what was going on. He asked some very important questions. One of the things that he got out of that was an admission by the CIA director that the NSA was tapping people's phone lines. So this is something that goes back to the 1970s. Mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, he points out in his article that it goes back to the 1950s that the CIA was collecting information on Americans. This is something that was started uh, even before that by Lyndon, uh, after that I should say, by Lyndon Johnson, who wanted uh, the uh, CIA to start doing counterintelligence operations on people who are anti-war, who are protesters, that sort of thing. Not just the FBI. Everybody's heard of the FBI's COINTEL program. 
Most people have forgotten about Seymour Hersh's uh, revelations about the CIA, and most people have completely forgotten about the fact that that resulted in the Pike Committee exposing the NSA and what they were doing to American citizens. Right, and we also learned that there in that hearing as well that the CIA was working with the media as well yes. on their COINTEL Pro. And with corporations. We found that the, uh, the NSA was working with AT&T, Western Union, uh, various, the same types of uh, large corporations that had the communications infrastructure. They were using that uh, along with the corporations, major corporations, to spy on the American people. I think it's important when we look at the fact that this was the first public testimony of the NSA to remember that today, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, now that Republicans have the majority, Richard Burr from North Carolina, has says he doesn't think there ever ought to be any intelligence hearing committees, that the public should not know anything that uh, the intelligence community does. The other thing that came out of this was we had the first lies of an NSA director to the public. That came out of the Pike Committee <laughs> hearings. He also lied about uh, tapping the phones and everything. He pointed out, he asked, you know, wh why are we doing this? What is the mission statement of the intelligence community? Is it effective? Is it making us safer? He pointed out failures, Leanne, uh, that had just recently occurred. Their failure to see the 1968 Tet Offensive, their failure to see the 1974 coup in Portugal, the 1974 invasion of Cyprus uh, by Turkey, the 1973 Yom Kippur War, all those were missed by the NSA, wow. by the CIA, even though they were spying on political dissidents in the United States. Perhaps that's why they missed all those things. We're and today, in a time loop. Exactly. Today we see, well, we have to do all this because of security, because of terrorism. Today they had spying on Occupy protesters or vegan potlucks and exactly. And today we have the uh, the the verdict and uh, the Boston bombing, Sarnayev brothers. Uh, where was the NSA? Where was the CIA mm -hmm. in terms of finding these guys? So yet another failure of that. So they've never really been about stopping terrorism. It's always been about cr crushing dissent. Absolutely. There's another parallel in this, Leanne, in terms of the Pike Committee hearings, and that is the way we're seeing the TPP handled today. The fact that we have uh, members of Congress, unfortunately, most of them can't even be bothered to read it. There is a provision for them set up to read it. But as Rand Paul pointed out, and as others have pointed out, you have to go to a special room. You have to sign in. Uh, you Someone you can't, hovers over your shoulder. You've right. got to destroy any notes you take. You can't take those notes out with you. They responded <laughs> a real prevarication saying, of course you can read it, but you can't tell anybody right. what you've read. Okay? This message will self-destruct. Yeah, you can take notes, but you can't take those notes out with you, okay? And so he had a similar thing happen with uh, the NSA when they came before the Pike Committee. He said, uh, where is your charter? Because the CIA had a charter, which they violated, okay? Mm -hmm. But he said, where's your charter? And then the guy says, well, you know, you can go down somewhere to look at it. This is the back and forth that goes uh, between uh, Pike and the head of the NSA. He said, you're talking about a document that set up the entire NSA. It's one which all members of Congress are entitled to see without shuttling back and forth downtown to look at it. And he came back and says, well, I can't show it to you because it's got secret material in it. And he goes, well, it seems incredible to me, frankly, this is Pike saying, that we're asked to appropriate large amounts of money for that agency. And in those days, it was $10 billion today. That'd be probably about $50 billion, which employs large numbers of people without being provided a copy of the piece of paper <laughs> by which the agency is authorized. He didn't want the, uh, the paperwork in put the into the congressional, yeah, yeah, in the public domain because they weren't created by legislation. They weren't created by charter. They were created by executive orders mm. of Truman. So this problem that we have with executive orders, this problem with ex excessive secrecy, with agencies that uh, are absolutely black, that cannot, uh, the public cannot see anything that they're doing, just like these trade organizations, just like today's NSA and CIA. This has all been going on right. for since World War II, probably earlier than that, but certainly that's been the pattern for a very yeah. long time. So the tyranny is, is nothing new, and journalists like Seymour Hersh, who are going to go that extra mile and dig deep and find out about things like this, yes. they are a threat, yes. seen as a threat. And so obviously one of the big things that people are, are saying, well, we can't take this story seriously, is because he uses anonymous sources. Yes, and they criticized him for that at the time. Uh, the Washington Post criticized him for that in this expose of the CIA. At the same time, the Washington Post had just broken Watergate with anonymous sources. The difference was, Leanne, that Seymour Hersh uh, 
uh, his, he has unnamed sources where they had anonymous sources. Their anonymous sources that they use at the Washington Post were presumably not known even to the editors. Whereas when he has unnamed sources, he makes sure that his editors know and vet who those sources are. That's the difference. Keeping the sources unnamed versus having uh, secretive sources that nobody other than the reporters, in the case of Washington Post, these were new reporters, cub reporters that had never done anything before. And they were allowed to use these uh, secretive sources like Deep Throat or whatever. Nobody mm -hmm. presumably knew who they were. Yet the Washington Post would still criticize him for this. Why? Because he's going after the intelligence operations that have been ineffective, that have been a uh, something. And, and you know, when they say they're making us safer, when I look at this uh, newspaper from <laughs> 1974, all over it is stuff about Iran. Okay, they're talking to former intelligence people. Who Richard Helms had by that time uh, left the CIA and had gone to Iran. He was the ambassador in Iran. Then we have the Shah asking Americans to push for big contracts in Iran. You need to understand that <laughs> Iran was essentially a state that was created and run by the CIA in the mid 70s, okay? They had their secret police, the Savak, a reign of terror on the Iranian people, mm. taking them, rendering them to uh, torture sites, uh, picking people up, as we see at Gitmo, other places, as we see the legal infrastructure in our NDAA, they had created that in Iran. So you wanna know what America is gonna look like if we don't stop this out of control surveillance state, this out of control torture state? Look at Iran under the Shah. It was a reign of terror, and of course, that's where all these guys were going to hide out at that time. So it just goes to show that when you give them a free reign, it doesn't make you safer Absolutely at all. Not. So it's incredible. I mean, it, it really is like we're in a time loop, just seeing the same exact stories on the front page with Iran and then attacking journalists who would dare go that extra mile to dig a little bit deeper, like Gary Webb or Cy Hirsch. Um, but also just looking at these NSA programs and how they were never about stopping terrorism because again and again and again, they failed. There's so many instances of where they did not stop the terror attacks. Could it be because they want them to take place? Uh, but truly, Operation Chaos and, and these other things were about crushing dissent. Totally ineffective, but as you point out, they had Operation Chaos, that's what Nixon called uh, the program. Before that, under Lyndon Johnson, under LBJ, it was called... Uh, Project Resistance. They worked with college administrators, campus security, local police to identify anti-war activists and political dissidents without any infiltration taking place, they said. Then Nixon combined all that together with Operation Chaos. And I thought it was kind of funny, Leanne, that you know there was um, this Mel Brooks TV comedy that was created called Get Smart. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the antagonist in that, the nemesis in it was uh, Chaos. Um, and that was about four years before these guys actually started this thing. So perhaps that's where that came from. But here's the difference. Today, it's much, much more dangerous because they did not have the technology in those days to record and analyze all these conversations. They could tap into people's conversations, but they were very limited, just like the Stasi was very limited in what they could do. Today, the the added uh, advantage of technology makes them far more dangerous, even though they're doing the same sorts of things. They have that additional leverage of technology that makes it far more dangerous. Right, and they've, they're actually, a lot of these, a lot of this new technology with social media and everything was created with the intent that they would be able to collect all of our data. They were, they're saying, wow, this is really wonderful. We're gonna mm -hmm. have, we're gonna be able to build a matrix-like reality, simulate what's going on in the real world, People are willingly giving up their data, letting us know where they are, what time they, they turn on their smart homes that are tracking us and just giving us all of this information. And uh, we've actually reported on some of these programs, uh, the Sentient World Simulation. Um, it's a continuously running mirror model of reality. And this, is a, this helps them predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. And that's just one program. Yeah. That's what's so troubling about the whole concept of mastering the human domain, which mm -hmm. is the subtitle of the Jade Helm logo. When you go back and you look at human domain analytics, they talked about how they were looking at national intelligence, then they took it down to regions, then they took it down to individuals. They're looking at everything about you, mm -hmm. who you know, your activities, tracking you constantly, and then looking at a context of politics and religion and various other things about you. That's what makes this all so dangerous. And what makes me so concerned about Jade Helm is that you can see, looking over the last several years, 
Uh, if you go back and you look at McRaven and others, they've been talking for quite some time about the special forces being boots on the ground for this intelligence gathering, saying you, you, can, you can gather a lot of intelligence and we can use that along with you to identify back bad people and to track them, uh, to create a map of uh, uh, the bad guys, essentially mm -hmm. overlay that over a geographical map. But you need boots on the ground. You need right. human intelligence there that can also be spying on people and reporting this back to you. So it is total. It's not just looking at your license plate as you drive by, not just having cameras everywhere, but also having physical spies on the street. And that's what Jade Helm is always is about, is this merging of the human domain analytics, activity-based intelligence, all these different aspects in with special forces, with the military, with the police, merging them all with the NSA. Right. How are people going to react if the water supply gets cut off or if there is a military coup in their state? How will they react? And they can see how the state of Texas has reacted. Predictive also. Mm -hmm. Looking at it and saying, well, I can see this. I think this might happen. Singling out people because they think they might commit some kind of a crime right. or an action in the future, taking action against them, but then also taking this as part of a PSYOP, analyzing it and trying to shut this down, taking away people's will to fight, taking away their ability to fight, using PSYOP operations and disinformation to people to mm -hmm. keep them passive. Yeah. It's all about population control. So they use the human domain analytics to master us, mm -hmm. and that can be psychologically or it can be physically in the case of special forces. Right, yeah. and, it, and you're, you're absolutely right. It is about numbing us to the presence of troops on the street, um, you know, in, in civilian clothes, gathering intel. And it, it, it's almost like when you are bombarded with all of this racism here every day, you become numb to it. Mm -hmm. You almost really stop caring. Oh, another riot. Oh, another protest. Oh, goodness. And that's essentially what happened back in the day when the Pike Committee hearing did this. People had seen so much about the CIA, uh, so many admissions with uh, Watergate and everything. The people just started turning off to government corruption. Right. They went back, turned inward, uh, just worked on themselves, their private life, their entertainment. They didn't pay any attention to this. We wound up not doing anything. The only thing that came out of it was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. Mm. And all that has done is serve to give a legal cover to the NSA's current dragnet surveillance. They just go to a FISA court mm -hmm. with one judge, no adversarial relationship, get him to say, yes, you can spy on, as Rand Paul called it, Mr. Verizon. And they go out and yeah. get everything that Verizon Blanket has. Yeah. Right. And it's so funny as well, because the American people, something has switched on with this whole Jade Helm. People are saying, this is, this is unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. But even in the face of that, they're still saying, this is completely normal. We do this all the time. It's just a little bit bigger. And, and there's drills and exercises in every state constantly now. And it's completely normal, even though in our spirit, the American people are saying, wait a minute, something isn't right with this. Yes. And it, it has trickled down to so many mainstream elements for a reason. And even in the face of that, we're being told it's completely normal. I think it's the slides, being able to see the maps there, makes it real to people, just like they had heard many times about dragnet surveillance and the intelligence agencies getting out of their legal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until they saw slides. Now, those slides labeling Texas and other places as hostile, that was a very crude representation. It was just for an exercise, but you have to realize the reality is far worse than that. The reality is that they are mapping you down to the individual level with human domain analytics. Geospatial intelligence goes back to 1996, five years after it was created in September of 2001. Does that sound like a familiar date? Uh -huh. September 2001. James Clapper, the guy who famously lied to Ron Wyden, said, no, we're not collecting anybody's data. James Clapper was set up his first time he was put as director of an intelligence agency. It was director of geospatial intelligence. And that's what they're using for human domain analytics. People should be very concerned about the fact that we have the military, the Homeland Security, and the NSA all merging together, working on this. And you can mm -hmm. see this going on now for the last 15 years. So this Jade Helm is not something new. It's just the next level. And as people see this, hopefully at some point they're going to wake up to what's happening. And hopefully, unlike what we saw with the Snowden leaks, people will make some changes and question what is the purpose of these organizations? Absolutely. Are they making us safer? Are they being effective with our money? 
is this something we want them to do or not? Because we, the people, are the ones who are controlling the government and have to take control of the government. We right. need to say, what is the mission going to be? Right, and it is our funding that's keeping it all going. And again and again and again, they have not proven to be worthy of all of our tax dollars because they haven't stopped a single terror attack. That's so right. that's not what they're really all about. And unfortunately, I think we're going to find out the truth, the transparency, when it's a little too late, when yeah. all of these uh, virtual you know, matrix reality is is turned on and, and we're already enveloped in this digital imprisonment, the mm -hmm. digital enslavement that we're helping to build with all this technology. And, you know, in the meantime, I hope that we are wrong. I, I would like to continue to just be the crazy conspiracy theorist. You know, I hope I just hope we aren't right about this. I hope they don't ever bring the hammer down on America. Well, they're selling all this with fear. Mm -hmm. They're selling it all with conspiracy. And when the enemy doesn't really exist, they eventually create the enemy for us. Mm -hmm. If the war and the threat doesn't exist, they create the war. They create ISIS. They do create physical threats. They don't just, you know, get their funding and leave it at, as imaginary. They make real threats who really go right. out and kill people. Mm. And that's what we should be concerned about. It's not only fear-mongering and conspiracy theory by the government, but the fact that they make it come true. Yeah, gosh, you're absolutely right about that. We... Uh Saw some of that footage earlier today with the brand new MRAPs that ISIS had. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. They will create this enemy. Well, while we're under attack, journalists, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists like Seymour Hirsch are also under attack. So here is a, another great report from John Bound. Just who is Cy Hirsch? Who is Cy Hirsch and why does what he says matter? Mr. Hirsch exposed the cover-up of the 1968 My Lai mass curve between 347 and 504 unarmed Vietnamese citizens and received the 1970 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for his work. He has notably investigated the CIA's secretive project Azorian. Hirsch recently exposed the mistreatment of detainees at the Iraqi prison Abu Ghraib. Mr. Hirsch has the journalistic integrity to take the lonely path seldom seen towards the truth. Now this award-winning journalist and touchstone to a fading era of investigative journalism faces an administration that has set a new record on what can only be declared as a war on transparency. The Society of Professional Journalists, made up of 38 groups, wrote a letter to the Obama administration criticizing its overall politically driven suppression of the news. Hirsch's solution to the lapdog media that whitewashes Obama's dirty laundry is to shut down news networks like NBC and ABC and fire 90% of the mainstream editors, replacing them with real journalists who are outsiders and not not afraid to speak truth to power. The Republic's in trouble. We lie about everything. Lying has become the staple, concluded Seymour Hirsch. The way to make government responsible is to hold it accountable. And the way to make government accountable is to make it transparent so that the American people can know exactly what decisions are being ma made, how they're being made, and whether their interests are being well served. The directives I am giving my administration today on how to interpret the Freedom of Information Act will do just that. For a long time now, there's been too much secrecy in this city. The old rules said that if there was a defensible argument for not disclosing something to the American people, then it should not be disclosed. That era is now over. Recently, Seymour Hersh said that the raid which killed Osama bin Laden in 2011 is one big lie and that not one word of the Obama administration's narrative on what happened is true. Speculation that the Obama administration may have embellished or outright lied about the true account of what happened has persisted mainly because the White House has refused to publicly release images of bin Laden's body. Although the White House said the corpse was immediately buried at sea in line with Islamic tradition, it quickly emerged that this was not standard practice. Numerous analysts have claimed that bin Laden had in fact been dead for years and that the raid on his alleged compound in Pakistan was little more than a stunt. It's on record that Steve Pachinik, uh, who worked as the top deputy to Henry Kissinger and who also is a high-level counsel on foreign relations member, was interviewed back in April of 2002 and said that bin Laden was dead and that was on ice and that in the future he would be used at a politically expedient time to bolster the government in the eyes of the people. He died of Marfan syndrome 
Uh, Bush Jr. knew about it. The intelligence community knew about it. CIA had already sent a position way before under the Clinton administration to see him at the American Hospital in Dubai. He was already very sick from Marfan syndrome, and he was already dying. So nobody had to kill him. He had El Zwahiri, who was a physician with him, who is still a physician. I don't know where he is. But we knew he was already dead by 9-11. Uh, it was very clear that he was dying at Tora Bora. He probably died. Tommy Franks, general, said uh, accidentally that he died. But Then Madeleine Albright in 2003, on December 17th, went on Fox News program and said that he was dead and on ice and that the Bush administration was thinking about rolling him out during the 2004 election if they needed it. But then because of that coverage, the inside baseball was they didn't. Other questions also persist, such as why the narrative and timeline of the raid has changed multiple times. Why the White House initially claimed that Situation Room photos showed Obama watching the raid live when in fact there was a blackout on the live feed. And why neighbors in the immediate area surrounding the compound said with absolute certainty that they had never seen bin Laden and that they knew of no evidence whatsoever to suggest he lived there. You know that if somebody new comes in your street, in your area, you always know. The next house is my other house, which I rented to my cousin friend. I never seen anything like that, and that's why I can't believe that. And to be honest, it's not true. Osama, maybe some other people, but Osama is not a, you know, the bird who came, fly, went to the inside, because this is restricted area. When we came out from outside to come here to, always army will say, oh, where's your ID card? So it's not believed. They were pounding Pakistani civilians and uh, poor, hapless uh, the villages there with their drone attacks, with the hellfires and with their reaper uh, missiles. So they have caused something like 2,500 casualties when the man that they were hunting was actually hiding uh, in, in one of the urban centers of Pakistan. Now this is remarkable. You want to believe what I call a Lewis Carroll fa fairy tale that bin Laden who the most hunted man since since 2002 in the world decided he's going to the one safe place to live is in a compound 40 miles from the well, look, main that's capital what, of Pakistan. That, I'm sorry, it goes against the grain. I've been doing this all my life, you know, and and uh, all I can tell you is I understand the consequences. I've been a reporter, as you know, for 50 years in this town. Not you know, everything we, turns out the way you think it's going to turn out. Also, even in well, your own career, I mean, I, I I would argue that a lot of the stories I wrote pretty much were pretty much on mark. John Baum, Infowars.com. General, what do you think about the FBI saying that there's a terror alert on Monday about a potential Fort Hood situation? The police are shoving people, shoving Alex, shoving the crowd. Here we go, folks, I'm being assaulted. Whether it's the radio show, the news websites, documentary films, or the nightly news, InfoWars is the tip of the spear. Is this another false flag stage attack to take our civil liberties and put more homeland security while sticking their hands down on the pants on the streets? It's up to us to set brush fires in the minds of men and women everywhere. And that's what PrisonPlanet.tv is designed to do. You watch the Assad regime is going to be blamed or accused of using chemical weapons against the so-called rebels. What we see now is a war against reality. It's a war against the truth. It's more vital than ever that supporters of freedom become members of PrisonPlanet.tv and share their membership with up to 11 friends and family. Visit InfoWarsNews.com today. Become a member, share your membership, and help take the InfoWar to the next level. From the water table, to our soils, to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139.
Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com. Now, Cleveland is bracing for possible race rights due to the fact that the officer accused of two counts of manslaughter could get lesser charges. Now, Officer Michael Brello was involved in a nighttime car chase in November of 2012. Now, all in all, 13 officers were involved in this incident. 137 shots were fired in all in total. Now, Officer Brello shot 49 times himself. 49 times. I mean, that is out of control. 15 of those shots were fired while Officer Brello was standing on top of the suspect's hood. He was in front of the vehicle and he fired an additional 15 shots into the windshield. Five of those shots were fatal, and that is what took out Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams. Now, the National Guard is alerting soldiers to report to duty for potential riots to happen in Cleveland. At least one National Guard company has been ordered to report to a home station on May 17th. That is this Sunday. The verdict is expected to be on May 18th or 19th of this month. Now, Cleveland police have also been seen driving around with riot shields sticking out of their trunks, anticipating the Michael Brello decision. Now, Hank Davis is a former gang member who now works with at-risk youth, and he heard that out-of-town agitators have already arrived in Cleveland and are pressuring residents to riot after the verdict. This is something that we saw happen time and time again in Ferguson and in Baltimore. You get people like Revcom, you get all these uh, individuals who thrive off of just complete and total destruction. What people don't understand is, is when you outlash like this when you when you when you get out of control like this it does nothing to help the fact that there is police brutality the fact that the the police are being militarized all this does is destroy the towns that you live in how does burning small businesses and flipping cars do anything to bring justice to two people who were brutally murdered by a police officer but I can assure you that Jakari Jackson and I will be on standby to deploy to Cleveland in case things get out of control. Him and I will be following this story very closely over the next 48 hours as things develop. So be sure to check from time and time again at InfoWars.com for more uh, updates. And also go to the Alex Jones Twitter and the Alex Jones YouTube channel. And I'd like to thank you all for getting us over a million subscribers. Once again, I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Jakari Jackson here, InfoWars.com. We have a new article on the site. House bill seeks to eliminate online ammo sales. And this is a New Jersey representative, Bonnie Watson Coleman, and H.R. 2283, known as the Stop Online Ammunition Sales Act of 2015, and it would require face-to-face -face purchases of ammunition. And with our Second Amendment in the United States of America, I don't have any issue with you buying your ammunition over the Internet. And I don't think that personal sales of firearms or ammunition require background checks. I know a lot of people want to have those uh, run ammunition sales as well. I don't agree with this because you could just as easily walk into Bass Pro Shop, Cabela's Academy, wherever, put down, you know, $1,000 by $1,000 worth of ammunition. Yeah, that's, you know catches people's attention but it is very much legal in the United States of America and to anybody would say well you know they're stocking up all this ammunition they're gonna go out there and, and shoot somebody oh look what just happened in Garland Texas and I definitely hope that Miss uh, Representative Coleman here takes a look at the Department of Homeland Security because I'm gonna bring up a throwback article from back in 2013 and the reason I'm bringing up this old article, they have many more rounds of ammunition now, but I like the point that Watson makes in this. They had purchased enough ammunition to fight the war in Iraq for another 30 years. And this is the Department of Homeland Security. This isn't the military. You know, somebody, you know, they got to be worried about some Red Dawn situation. This is the Department of Homeland Security has this massive amount of ammunition. I definitely hope somebody will take a look into that. Also, DHS purchasing paper targets of pregnant women and little children and when I say children I'm not talking about some 17 year old in a trench coat I'm talking about a little 10 year old boy is holding his gun like this and smiling and grinning and then we wonder why we have shootings like what happened to Tamir Rice when you're teaching these guys that you know some child could easily be your enemy is out to kill you so that's what's going on on that front also they're trying to ban body armor in states like California 
which I'm also against because, you know, just me doing the job that I do, myself, Joe Biggs, and some of the other crew members, we go out to very da dangerous situations, and sometimes we take body armor with us. And it's not everybody's like, well, you got to worry about the crowd. When I was out in Ferguson, I had little to no issue with the crowd. Like, yeah, there's some guy who wanted to argue with me about you know, how cool it was to burn down buildings and stuff. But by and large, I was more concerned about my safety from what the police were doing. The police were shooting rubber bullets, at least when we got we were there back in August. In November, they were much better behaved. But when we were out there in August, they were shooting rubber bullets indiscriminately into a blinding cloud of tear gas. You know, and Joe Biggs, of course, got shot with a rubber bullet, had a nice big bruise to show for his efforts. So we have body armor. We have soft body armor. We have a hard plated body armor, which is like basically strapping a skillet to yourself and running around. But we have it just to deal with these type of situations, gas masks as well. And, you know, other people, they may have them for other things. If you just want a, a bulletproof vest for home defense, that's your business. I don't think the government should be able to tell you not to do that. And while we're talking about the DHS arming up with so many rounds of ammunition about people using these things for self-defense, let's also talk about the other things that are going on in our government. Let's start with running guns into Mexico with Operation Fast and Furious. New documents obtained by CBS News show Attorney General Eric Holder was sent briefings on the controversial Fast and Furious operation as far back as July 2010. That directly contradicts his statement to Congress. And for you guys who don't know about this, no, I'm not talking about Vin Diesel and all those guys. Operation Fast and Furious, which happened under the Justice Department, was a plan to give, well, not just a plan, something that was actually implemented and done. They handed over functioning weapons to Mexican drug cartels to track the weapons. So I guess their logic was, was like, yeah, we'll uh, let these guys take these guns, functioning guns, not malfunctioned or, you know, not uh, deformed or any way. We'll give these guys the guns to go out there and commit crimes, and then when we catch these guns at the crime scenes, we'll know these guys uh, were handlers of the guns. We'll be able to trace the guns back, which makes no sense because how many innocent people are going to die in this plan before it comes to fruition? And also beyond that, if you want to talk about arming of people, let's talk about arming ISIS rebels. The article came out last year, airdropping grenades into the hands of ISIS. And people will say, this is not a big deal. A pallet of grenades is not going to take down the U.S. military. I do agree. But what about all the innocent civilians who are unarmed in those regions? They have to conflict with this now. Disarming people isn't the way to go. And we saw this recently with the representative in Michigan, you know, shooting his shotgun at his ex-wife's car. Chikara Jackson signing off. You can find more reports on the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, today I had a video sent to me multiple times by different people showing a convoy in South Carolina traveling southbound on I-95. Okay, so these are troops that are on a convoy in South Carolina. It's military operations. Look at all of these tanks on Interstate 95 South. I mean, this is like a war zone. What is going on here? What is going on here? Um, this is nothing unusual. Um, this has nothing to do with Jade Helm. I can just tell you from my time at Fort Bragg, um, it's not going to be unlikely in that area to see convoys driving up and down that road. The thing is, though, is a lot of people are concerned about the upcoming Jade Helm exercises. They'll be conducted over eight weeks in five different states. So... The way the military works is they're going to conduct these operations at the time they say in those areas. There is normal military training that happens on these roads. And the reason being is when I was at Fort Bragg, we would actually get on 95 and drive south and spread our vehicles out to see how the communications uh, systems that we had, our radios, see if they were linked up good, if they worked, if our headsets worked. And simply, that's all this is. This has nothing to do with Jade Helm whatsoever. These aren't tanks. These uh, look like uh, strikers without the uh, cages on the side for uh, the stop RPGs. These are just regular strikers driving up and down the road, and you can see the guys sticking out. They all have the helmets on with the mouthpieces, and they're simply doing communications checks. And like I said, when I was a brag, that's something that we did a lot of the time. Uh, it's not uncommon because, you know, when you go overseas and you have to get into these convoys, like on Route Tampa and Iraq, it's a very long stretch of road. You have to spread out. And the reason you spread out 
over a mile long convoy or so is so if an IED goes off it'll hit that one vehicle and that amount of personnel inside that vehicle whereas if you bunch up your vehicles um, one RPG shot, one IED, whatever it may be, can take out multiple vehicles. And that's why you have to spread out over a long stretch of road, which would make your communications equipment deteriorate in a sense. So all they do is they drive up and down the road, do combo checks, and make sure that this stuff is working. So there's nothing to worry about with this. I don't think this has anything to do with Jade Helm whatsoever. Just be calm. Not everything you see has to do with that. I understand there's speculations with what's going on due to the flip-flopping of the architects of Jade Helm lying about the people coming to the government to get the uh, property to be used, saying there'll be no compensation. We're finding out that's all a lie. The fact that the Army lied about the slideshow in the first place. So I understand people's concerns, but this is something that I would not be worried about. This is normal to see.